Hi everybody, welcome. I'm James Hanworth, the president of China Institute. A big welcome to you. I see some familiar faces and some old friends and some new friends. For those of them that are new to China Institute, thank you for putting up with us in our temporary space. We're still in the middle and the thrust of growing. We have growing things. We moved downtown about two and a half, almost three years ago, and we're still building out. But we're in for a treat tonight. I want to say a welcome and a hello. We have our Secretary of our board, where's Ingrid? I know she's here. Class. She's in class, she'll be out. And our former Secretary of the Board, Yvonne Wong, is here. So great to have them with us tonight. We're in for a really special treat tonight. Um, you know, one of the things about China Institute, I think that people who come here, you're, we feel and we're scared that a lot of Americans walk away with an impression about China that's very outdated. And one of the things that we're really committed to is bringing authentic, genuine voices to let you know what's really happening on the ground in China so we can make sense of this complicated and often confusing environment. And the treat I was talking about tonight is where we have a really intimate discussion. The luminaries that we're welcoming here tonight, Nick and um, Dr. Wei, are so renowned that the fact that we get them in a small and intimate audience to interact with us in the discussion, moderated by Dinda, who runs all of our programs here, here and is in her own right a China expert, is really going to be something to, to look forward to. So we had the explanation in front of you. Nick Lardy doesn't really need much of an introduction, but I did want to plug his new book, The State Strikes Back, because it's a fascinating commentary on everything that's going on, and I'm sure we will tease him out a little bit about that tonight. We also have Dr. Wei Shang who's here this evening. He's a professor at Columbia University's Graduate School of Business, and a reform banker and a leading authority on finance and banking industry in China. So without further ado, why don't we hand it over to David? Thank you. Okay, so Nick, to start, we have oh, a little bit of a presentation of, of his book. So why don't you come on up? Let me make sure you're all set over here. Um, Good. Well, thanks very much for having me. I'm looking forward to uh, this. I'm not going to give you 15 minutes. I'm not sure oh, sorry, I'm going to uh, as Dinda said, I'm going to give you just a brief introduction to the book, and then we're going to have a discussion with uh, the judge and I, and a lot of the issues that I talk about in the book are relevant, but also uh, come up in the discussion. Um, the State Stress Act is, is kind of uh, trying to explain how China, basically since Xi Jinping came into power, has moved away from the market-oriented approach to economic development and has emphasized the state. Uh, uh, I think state-owned companies are dragging down China's economic growth over the last uh, few years, and uh, I'm, I'm still in the very optimistic camp, I think, while many people think that China is going to continue to slow down, I think if China went back to the more reform, market-oriented pattern of resource allocation, they could probably grow at 8% or maybe even a little bit more for another decade. So let me, here's Larry Summers. You know, Larry Summers, uh, five years ago, was saying, well, China is going to slow down to 2% per capita. That's what all countries do. It's the most regular uh, pattern. Uh, and other people, have, lots and lots of people have talked about trying to slow down as if it's inevitable. And my view is a little bit different. I think a lot of the slowdown is explained by policy. Uh, some of you will recall in the fall of 2013, they had a very important meeting. They endorsed a market oriented reform more strongly than ever before. The key phrase was that the market must be the decisive force in the allocation of resources, which as far as I can tell from extensive research, that phrase had never appeared in a party document. Now, there were other phrases in that document that still talked about SOEs. Um, but the reality has been that Xi Jinping has not implemented very much of this uh, document in reform. So I want to take you through. I, I can't go through all of what led to the rise of a market economy, but I would certainly highlight a few important things. Price reform, in the old system, every price was set by the state. Price commission, uh, now virtually every price is set by supply and demand in the market. You know, they still have controls on prices of electricity and pharmaceuticals and a few other things that are not that unusual. They had no legal uh, basis for establishing private firms in the early years of reform. That dramatically changed. Uh, credit started flowing to private firms. Private firms became the dominant source of investment in the Chinese economy. This is all pre-Xi Jinping. 
and state firms didn't get smaller, but they were displaced, so their share of output declined rather dramatically over time. In the manufacturing sector, for example, at the beginning of reform in 1978, state companies were producing almost 100% of output. Um, by today, they're down to around 20, 25%. Where most of the output is being produced by private firms or by foreign investment firms. So what's, what's been reversed? Um, first of all, the biggest reversal that you can document is a huge change in the flow of bank credit. Uh, after Xi Jinping came into power, much more credit was going to state banks, and I'll show you the data in a minute. The share of investment undertaken by private firms, which was zooming up at a very rapid rate, plateaued, and then has actually come down slightly. Uh, and the growth of state firms in the industrial sector, which had been very slow, uh, accelerated and in recent years has been growing more rapidly than private firms. And the other thing that happened under Xi Jinping was a lot of what I call anti-competitive policies, mega mergers that merge firms in the same industry, and I think has uh, undermined incentives for innovation, reducing cost, uh, and so forth, and I'll show you some, some evidence of that as well. So the first one is what's happening to credit, and you can see the fact that this data series didn't start until 2010, so I can't go back further. But uh, you can see in 2010, 11, and 12, a little bit more than half the credit was going to private companies, and uh, only about a third was going to state companies. This changed dramatically, uh, particularly uh, after 2013. As you can see, uh, the share of bank credit going, this is bank credit to non financial enterprises, uh, rose up to more than 80%. Now, this diagram is in the book, and I always wanted to update this with one of the most recent versions of the book that was published by People's Bank came out. This table that these data was containing was, is no longer being published. So, uh, but I've written a blog that I think argues that most of the credit is still flowing uh, to state companies even after 2016. So that was a pretty dramatic change. And you can see the, the effect. In the early years when China's private companies were getting a lot of credit, their share of investment was rising quite steeply, reached about 50% or so, then it began to level off, and then for several years, it's been going down, and the share of state companies, which had been declining uh, all along, has, uh, you know, by 2014, 15, is going up again. So this is the rise of the state, which uh, led me to title this book, The State Strikes Back. Industrial output, you can see this is the growth of output of private versus uh, state companies in the industrial sector, and you can see Private companies are growing much, much more rapidly uh, than state companies all the way uh, as far back as the data go. But, and of course, everyone is slowing down after the global financial crisis, but the gap between the two forms of ownership remained fairly large. But starting at around 2015, state companies began to recover and grow more rapidly and private companies continue to slow down. And so by the time you get to 2018, for the first time, I think in the first time ever in the reform period, state companies were growing more rapidly. And I think this was a function of uh, access to credit and other things that were going on that uh, disadvantaged private companies. Uh, another factor that I should mention is that <coughs> A, a lot of private, not a lot, but a number of private companies in this period were getting nationalized. They were being taken over by the government. And the Chinese Communist Party Central Committee and the, and the State Council, the State Council was their highest administrative government organ, put out a directive saying that nationalization of private companies has to end. So maybe one of the reasons that investment of private companies was going down is that private entrepreneurs were thinking to themselves, well, I can invest and build up this company, but if there's a risk, it's going to be taken over by the government, then I should be putting my money into something else, maybe buying property in Sydney or Vancouver or uh, not, anyway, not, not building up the, uh, their, their, their firms. Then we have a whole bunch of mergers that occur. This is what I was referring to earlier on the anti-competitive environment that emerged, particularly among the big state companies. All these companies are very large conglomerates. 
Many of them have dozens, if not hundreds, of subsidiaries. And they merged countries, companies that were in the same industry together. And I think that had a very deleterious effect, as I mentioned. Uh, reduced the incentive for innovation, uh, cost control, etc. And th this is a little bit complicated diagram, but look at the second to the last column. And you can see what happened as these mergers continued. Originally, these companies had returns on assets that weren't stellar by any means, six, six and a half, six point seven percent. But after that, they declined continuously down to something more in the neighborhood of about two and a half percent. So their returns, their efficiency as measured by return on assets, went down. And they had enormous, enormous access uh, to bank credit and other uh, the corporate bond market. You can see their assets went from about 10 trillion up to 55 trillion and only about 20% of that expansion of the assets could have been financed with retained earnings. We know what the profits were, we know what the tax rate was. So most of this growth of assets was financed either by bank credit or by issuing bonds in the domestic bond market. So it's really rather striking that as their returns <coughs> deteriorated quite dramatically, they were able to get access to more and more external funding that is funding external to the firm that uh, allowed them to continue to expand. Uh, many of these firms, um, this, is, this is under SASIC, the State, uh, State Asset Supervision and Administration Commission, it's kind of a mouthful, so most of the time everyone calls it SASIC. They have had a big emphasis on size, and when the, I, when I met the uh, chairman of this group uh, a, a few years ago, and, at a, at a small meeting, and his main bragging point was how big his companies were. In the year we were together, he claimed, I think, no doubt accurately, that the revenues of his companies were 26 trillion RMB, which is an immense amount. In, in that year, GDP was uh, in something in the neighborhood of 60, 70 trillion. So, but I thought to myself, if you have unlimited access to capital and you borrow more and more money, even your productivity is declining, it's not that hard to grow your top line growth. You never would talk anything about what the profitability goes or return on assets. It was just you know, it was a size. Emphasis was on size. And he was really reflecting the political priorities of Xi Jinping, because Xi Jinping started in around 2013, 2014, talked repeatedly about how state companies have to be bigger. And the banks responded by lending them more money, the revenues grew, but you can see the, the productivity uh, went down. Here's for the whole state sector, uh, return on assets you can see it, it's been declining continuously uh, and is now at about 2.5%. This is industry and services uh, combined, all of the companies that are uh, so-called state-controlled companies, either owned outright by the government or the government is the uh, majority dominant, uh, majority or dominant owner. So this is what has been pulling down China's growth. These companies get more and more access to capital, but their productivity uh, goes down. So my estimate is roughly that um, this set of policies has reduced China's growth maybe by as much as two percentage points over the last uh, five or six, seven, eight years. And I tend to the view that uh, since China's per capita level of output <coughs> is still only about a quarter of the U.S. level, there is still enormous potential for convergence, uh, as we saw elsewhere in East Asia in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. But I think capturing the potential for convergence will require a somewhat different approach than we've seen, uh, particularly in the Xi Jinping uh, period. So that's. That's the brief introduction.
I want to thank you. You've given us a lot to think about, Nick. Um, and I wanted to open by saying that, you know, I know that economics are very hard to read and it's a science, but often open to many different interpretations. So I wanted to share with you, I lived in Moscow from 1992 to 1994, so I'm going to share with you my favorite Russian economics joke before we jump in. So there's a great Russian economist who's being interviewed, and the interviewer says, Dmitri, in one word, how do you describe the Russian economy? And Dmitri says, good. <laughs> and the interviewer says, Dmitri, in two words, how do you describe the Russian economy? And he says, not good. <laughs> so, given that, uh, let's jump right in and I'll let you guys share your insights with us. But, um, so I, I wanted to start by, uh, with a question, I guess, for both of you um, about whether there are recent signs emerging that um, things are opening up again a little bit. I mean, I, I was reading a document that suggested, uh, I'll just list a couple of things, and then you guys can respond as to whether these are serious or important or, you know, whether things are really changing or not. But there was a report by the Development Research Center uh, in Beijing acknowledging that there are market distortions as a result of industrial policies. Um, there have been, the government has listed for the first time 2020 timetables, real timetables for lifting foreign equity caps on futures, the futures industry, securities, insurance, and banks. Um, there's been, in October, the State Council, in a document, pledged to ensure, as we were discussing earlier, to ensure that all types of business entities have equal access to inputs, in, including land, credit, licenses, all that kind of stuff. Um, Egon was recently quoted talking about, you know, return using some kind of normal monetary policies. Um, a vice commerce minister talked about eliminating uh, foreign direct investment restrictions in financial services. So my question is simply, is something changing? Are you starting to see, you know, important changes, or is it, you know, how, how do you how do you interpret what you're saying? Yeah, and please do. You can see I'm holding it close because the mic works best when it's close to mouth. Yeah, I'm gonna make sure it's on. Hold on, let me turn it on for you. Okay. There we go. Uh, yes, indeed. I think in the last uh, uh, few years, especially the last year and a half, uh, there have been a lot of uh, uh, policy changes towards making the economy more open, including lifting uh, uh, ownership restrictions of uh, foreign financial institutions. Uh, you know, uh, I mentioned to you. Uh, before this started, that uh, I spoke at the UBS uh, Global Investor event uh, early this year, and this was a week after Chinese government announced, uh, uh, you know, removing the cap uh, that they can become a majority of it. Within a week, within a week, it registered for this, and, and the conference enterprise this enterprise is fact uh, very prominently. And there are many other uh, similar opening uh, measures in the financial service sector. And the good trade that I said, uh, why China is fighting the trade war with the US by escalating tariff on imports from the US, it has been lowering uh, uh, tariff on imports from any, uh, anywhere else. On the domestic, domestic side, we see less, uh, perhaps in the form to, uh, relative to uh, relative cross border barriers, and yet, uh, it, it is, uh, it's, uh, still, uh, we see a series of tax reforms uh, reducing uh, corporate income tax reducing the uh, employer's contribution to social security uh, taxes, re uh, reducing uh, very value tax uh, twice. And, and many of those uh, tax reforms uh, are meant to help uh, to raise competitors, competitors of the firms, especially private sector firms, because there's a concern that private sector firms are not doing very well in government, and especially the Prime Minister and his colleagues are trying very hard to try to help uh, with those. And, and you mentioned uh, uh, the, the risk of relatively recently announced competitive neutrality, meaning treating uh, private sector firms the same way as sale firms in terms of procurement, input, and so on. Um, you know, are uh, certainly being you know, discussed and announced, and we want to, you know, we want to, to, be to see whether there are more uh, actual policies will be implemented along those lines. Mm -hmm. Nick, how do you interpret the changes that you are seeing? Well, I agree with Sean Jim. There has been. Maybe there's a cell phone. I wonder if there's a cell phone that's causing problems. Sorry about that. 
Um, I agree with Sean Jim that there has been <laughs> there has been very significant reform in the area of what I would call international trade and international investment. Uh, lifting ownership caps, opening up some sectors that have previously been off limits for foreign companies. Uh, a lot I could give you lots of examples. But in the purely domestic economy, I don't think we've seen much progress in, in recent in the last couple of years. Credit seems to be going overwhelmingly to state companies. Uh, the programs for trying to improve the productivity of state companies, I think, are not well designed. Some of them have been in effect for years and have not, not had good results. Uh, they're continuing this program of mergers that I mentioned. The two biggest shipping shipbuilding companies and shipping companies have just been merged. And so you still have this policy framework domestically that is favoring state companies. The subsidies going to state companies uh, continue to increase, uh, and that's you know not a surprise because according to their own data, about 40% of state companies lose money. Almost none of them go out of business or get taken over in mergers. They just keep borrowing more money and carry on uh, uh, with the kind of fairly <coughs> negative results, which I showed you in a, in a couple of the slides. So. <coughs> They're moving ahead in terms of international reform of trade and investment to a certain extent, but I think on the domestic side, uh, there's less progress. So what do you think happened? That's, that's I guess, the question <coughs> is, you know, we know that, as you said, uh, you know, Xi Jinping talked about the market playing a decisive role in the economy after the, and, and in 2013, and, and at that time, after the third plenum of the 18th Party Congress, Many China watchers kind of said, "Oh wow, now we get it. Xi Jinping actually is a reformer, and things are going to—you know—things are moving, going to continue moving forward in that way." Um, Nick, in your book, you talk about the fact that the leaders feel—they sort of recognize that state-owned firms might be a drag on China's economic growth, but that they feel that they are essential to maintaining the position and control of the party. So, I guess that means that. They decided that growth is no longer the number one priority that it had been since ever since 1992. I would say. So the question is, what happened? Did they simply lose their nerve? Uh, were there political considerations? What do you think? How do you analyze what happened and why they shifted course? Well, I, I don't have a good answer other than to say that I think Xi Jinping decided at some point that consolidation of political power was the most important priority for him. We've seen that in the, you know, the increased control over all aspects of Chinese society, at universities, non-governmental organizations, the increased role of security services. And a part of that, I think, is his view that big state companies is, is an element that gives him more control and more power, uh, you know, culminating in his uh, getting uh, the Constitution changed so he could serve uh, more than two terms. Uh, as president. So I think he has been all about power. It was certainly reflected in his anti-corruption campaign uh, and most of the things uh, that we've been talking about. So I think that what we, at least I'll just speak for myself, but I think many of us felt that the legitimacy of the party depended ultimately on continuing to have very rapid economic growth. And if you looked over the 40 years, you know, that seemed to be the main objective. We want to grow more rapidly, to improve the living standards, um, and so forth. But I think that that goal has been diminished under Xi Jinping. Uh, they're still growing at six percent, so it's not as if they're in a, in a depression or something like that. But they're not growing at the ten percent rate that they were uh, for thirty-five years. Mm -hmm. Did you have? Yes. I have a question about you know, why uh, we see a slow down. In the reform moment of the last few uh, years, besides the ideology, uh, the top of the line. Can you say here? Sorry, it's almost half. There, that's better. Much better. And the question about why uh, uh, reform momentum seems to have slowed down the last few years. Besides ideology and the personal belief that leader, I, uh, I speculate, I speculate the global financial crisis okay. and its aftermath actually play a very important role as well in two ways. Uh, you know, number one, uh, I, I think the global financial crisis has uh, greatly, you know, there's always uh, different voices uh, among uh, uh, people who are, uh, within the government. It's called the, you know, the character of pro-reformers and uh, pro-more uh, traditional way of managing 
uh, economy. Global financial crisis, I think, uh, weakened the bargaining power of those pro reform people relative to the others. Because you know, uh, the, 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 the conservative people will say, look, you know, you've always been putting up your legs. It's the model for us to emulate. See what happens there. Right? So, so, so uh, um, I, I think, uh, uh, rightly or wrongly, there's a sense that just emphasizing market, just uh, emphasizing withdrawing the uh, role of government uh, from the economy, just implementing deregulation might not be the right uh, approach. So that's one thing, uh, one uh, way in which global financial rights might have. There's a famous quote in <coughs> Hank Paulson's book where he quotes Wang Qishan, who actually says to him, our teacher is no longer looking so good. Indeed. Another uh, way, another way through which uh, global financial rights might, might have slowed down the reform in China uh, is that, you know, let's recall in the financial sector, right, here and as well as in Europe, uh, in response to financial crisis, central banks uh, in the Eurozone and, and here and other uh, high-income countries trying to revive the economy by pushing out more liquidity. Mm -hmm. The central banks feel power. Central bank can make the cost of capital lower to commercial banks, mm -hmm. but they cannot quite push the uh, commercial banks to push out money to the real economy. The Chinese uh, you know, government, inspired by the U.S. Uh, uh, stimulus program, mm -hmm. roll out mm -hmm. its own version of a very uh, uh, big stimulus program uh, with a, uh, you know, a credit injection as a, as a one key component. And, by, can, way, and by the way, maybe save the global economy by doing it. Might play a role, certainly play a role <laughs> to make the uh, global economy to, to grow uh, uh, somewhat faster than otherwise would be the case. Mm -hmm. One of the ways it, it did it is by ordering state-owned banks. Yeah. Please roll out your, your liquidities back. What I'm saying is, you know, there's no doubt that you know, state ownership has uh, its efficiency uh, cost. But in facing the trade off between efficiency and financial stability, they thought, oh, maybe we got something wrong. Right. We, we, we thank them. They think they might, they, they, may, they felt lucky that they still have some state owned firm they can order. They help to, uh, help, help to deliver a bit of stability be faster than uh, in ways that their uh, you know, high income market-based economies, counterparts uh, couldn't. I think these two aspects mm -hmm. uh, of global financial rights might have play, played a role there. Yeah, it seems like, I think fear and stability are two really important words when you look at sort of what motivates the Chinese leadership, you know, vis-a-vis -vis many of their policies. But um, <clears throat> we've, we've all got the U.S.-China trade war on our minds and all the new um, buzzwords, decoupling, etc. So let's let's talk about decoupling for a second. There, there seems to be a consensus building that decoupling, and by that I mean really separating the U.S. economy from the Chinese economy, decoupling of the U.S. and Chinese economies is, is inevitable. And maybe this even already happened. Um, multinationals, we know that multinationals have started moving their supply chains to other countries um, as China's labor rates rise and the workforce diminishes and also as a way to reduce what they might see as over-reliance on China. Um, so do you think, firstly, do you think decoupling is inevitable? Um, what will that look like? Uh, and is it a result of the trade war or is it something that's you know, increasing tariffs or do you think it's, it's a result of other more fundamental factors? Um. You gotta push it, push it up until the um, up. This is a complicated subject, but I would begin by saying I don't think there has been much decoupling yet. Okay. Um, and I, you know, I'm a person who looks at the data, as you could imagine from the slides you saw. Foreign investment going into China continues to be quite strong. Uh, in the and global, I'm wondering if you turn the volume on that one down. It's just there's a lot of feedback. So. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, Go ahead. Globally, according to the OECD, in the first half of this year, compared to the second half of last year, foreign direct investment flows at globally are down by about a fifth. Investment flows into China over the same period compared to the same pace are up 8%. And we're 82 billion US dollars in the first half. So there's still a lot of new investment going into China. Thousands and thousands of new foreign firms are being established every month. So 
we may read about including, this. including tons of U.S. investment. Uh, well, we, the data that I'm quoting now is uh, aggregate investment. We don't get high frequency data just on what's coming from the U.S. And the U.S. has never been a big investor in China. Most of China's investment is coming from other places. So this would actually go to my point. I would say if there is decoupling, it's going to be decoupling of the United States from the rest of the world because other countries are not decoupling from China. Investment is flowing in. Companies that are there are reinvesting their profits. They see China as a very strong market. So, sure, some companies are leaving China, but companies have been foreign companies have been leaving China for decades. Uh, you know, some of them go in with a bad business strategy and leave. Some of them were in very, very labor-intensive uh, production processes. As Chinese wage rates rose, they moved to Bangladesh and uh, places in Southeast Asia. And it was a natural evolution. So there's always been inflow and outflow. And what I'm suggesting is I don't think the outflow now is greater than it has been in recent years. Now that could change because companies, um, you know, are waiting to see how the trade frictions are resolved. They're not decamping overnight because, uh, you know, they may hope that the things will settle down. But the key thing to keep in mind is that foreign companies are in China primarily to serve the domestic market, the, the Chinese domestic market, which is very large and still growing more rapidly than any other place uh, in the world. I think a lot of us tend to think of companies using China as an export platform, and so they have this big supply chain, they assemble things in China and then sell in the U.S. There's certainly some of that, obviously, in consumer electronics, iPhones uh, are probably the best example. But the big U.S. investors in China are companies like Caterpillar, mm -hmm. which has 34 companies making construction equipment in China. Obviously, China is the biggest construction okay. equipment market in the world. They're not trying to Oh, they're not? They're wholly oh, foreign home. Wow. Otis Elevator, you know, more oh. high rises going up in China than anywhere else. The elevator market is, you know, if you're Otis, you want to be there. So uh, trade frictions won't necessarily change uh, these companies' views, and they're not going to, to leave China. So um, I, I think decoupling has, uh, well, I'll, I'll turn it around a little bit. I think there are certainly some people in the United States and the administration who are in favor of decoupling, and they, decoupling to them means that the United States will embark on policies that are designed to slow down China's uh, moving up the value chain or technological, uh, you know, so China does now become a technological giant, um, but it's it's not clear that they will be able to um, succeed in this. I was just looking at the data, for example, on semiconductors. We've all been reading about how a bunch of Chinese companies are on the entity list, mm -hmm. and uh, U.S. companies aren't supposed to be selling them anything. Sales of semiconductors and semiconductor equipment from the United States to China over the summer and continuing uh, even through October are above trend, higher than they've been over the average of, say, uh, 2017 and 2018. So some of these controls are not exactly having the kinds of effects that people thought. Interesting. Okay. So I would uh, say that uh, uh, decoupling is uh, certainly not inevitable. Can you hear? I'm, I'm afraid it's not. So I would say three things. There, the coupling between U.S. and, and Chinese economies uh, is not inevitable, and it's not obviously uh, beneficial to the U.S. Uh, either. Uh, the, the, the so you think it's definitely not beneficial to the U.S.? I, 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 I can explain why yes. it's the case. Right? Number two, I think uh, when people pointing to, you know, international firm leaving China as evidence of decoupling, they might be confused by. So, as uh, Nick uh, was pointing out, the Chinese computer advantage is, is switching very, very fast with yeah. rising labor costs, textile, and other traditionally labor intensive things. Uh, China can no longer compete uh, with Vietnam, Indonesia, uh, you know, India, I mean, Philippines, many other countries with very large population, much, much lower uh, labor costs. Even without a trade war, you're going to see that happening as well. It's not just international firms going to those countries, lower labor cost countries, Chinese firms are doing doing that, and that's, that's within expectation. Yeah. Um, at, at the same time, uh, you know, China is developing new computer advantage, and you see other you know, mid-end, high-end uh, manufacturing uh, investment continue to go into China. Uh, 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 this is exactly what uh, Nick was pointing out. The third thing I want to say uh, is that uh, 
there's a misunderstanding that you know, here some of the discussion uh, in this country seems to uh, think China is the US most important economic competitors. China may be the strategic competitors. And, and the topic discussion almost, uh, almost sometimes culture their way. And that's actually very wrong headed. The most important economic competitors for US are Germany and Japan, countries with comparable levels of technical sophistications. These countries, like the US, are very well integrated with China through supply chain. Uh, for example, uh, the most important international all the parts supplied to German auto, uh, German auto industries used to be France, UK, Japan. Today is China. China is the Germany's uh, number one uh, auto part and uh, component suppliers. They don't want to decouple. So decoupling means, for US, means increasing cost of production for, for US, losing competitiveness with vis a vis your true comp uh, competing firms, the German firm, Canadian firms. Uh, Japanese firms. So, 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 so for that reason, I think that it would not be very sensible for for US to talk about at least as a comprehensive topic. I imagine that there very selected set of uh, uh, industries are uh, truly defense related for which US willing to sacrifice uh, efficiency, sacrifice competitiveness uh, to do uh, to do some bigger thing for it. Like the society to be prepared to pay for it. So, so therefore, as a as an overall strategy, it's just not workable strategy. So, okay, that's <clears throat> totally fascinating. I have two questions to sort of follow up on, on those comments. So, I was at a lunch the other day, somebody else here was at the same lunch, where one China investor said um, that any corporate leader in a boardroom today, American corporate leader in a boardroom today, who is not discussing reducing exposure to China should not be in the boardroom. And so I want to ask you what you think about that. But then the second thing is all sort of connected. You know, you're talking about Caterpillar, Otis, and the semiconductor industry, all of whom view China as a very important market, right? You're saying semiconductor sales continue to go up, and Caterpillar, and Oak, you know, all this stuff. The China market is obviously very, very important to them. At the same time, you have CFIUS, the Commission on Foreign Investment in the U.S., expanding its mandate and it's expanding its definition of you know what constitutes a security risk and all that kind of stuff and so you know it i guess my question is it's a little bit of a hard part but my question is why don't these companies kind of stand up and say that they think that the current policy is wrong and it's going to be harmful to them potentially harmful to them um you know Sifius is talking about you know, preventing the right to sell these products, etc., and uh, you know, and even talking about you know possible other other things as well, including delisting Chinese companies, etc. You have to wonder who that who is this going to damage most, and and why aren't American companies standing up for the market that they care so much about? Well, <clears throat> to some extent, they are. Um, Virtually every uh, trade association, industrial group has been critical of Trump's approach okay. to China using tariffs. They have said categorically tariffs are going to be harmful, unbalanced to the U.S. economy, and it should not be the primary policy instrument. So they have, they have uh, at least, mm -hmm. you know, they kind of say, well, there are some things China should do differently, but we don't think. This, this kind of uh, wholesale tariff approach is the right way to go. So to that extent, they're pushing back a little bit, but I think many of these corporations are very reluctant to take it on Trump directly, and quite frankly, they're all campaigning behind the scenes. You know, on December 15th, there's supposed to be 25% tariffs on another, what, 160 billion, which includes iPhones and a lot of consumer electronic products, which have been carefully left off the list. Well, you know, Apple's been lobbying furiously to make sure that iPhones are exempt. If these tariffs go into effect on December 15th, they want an exemption. So people that buy their next iPhone won't have to pay a lot more. And uh, maybe, maybe, maybe it would be granted. So there's a lot of behind the scenes maneuvering, but most of it is, you know, in support of what I would call predictably, you know, very specific corporate interests. Uh, there's not a kind of comprehensive pushback on, on, uh, on the approach. But I think, um, you know, the U.S.-China Business Council does surveys of its members, these are several hundred of the largest U.S. companies involved in China, uh, mostly investing in China. 
And their most recent survey, uh, which came out in the late summer, I can't remember the exact number, but something like 90-some percent said they had not moved any mm -hmm. facilities, and 67 percent said they had no plans to move anything. So I think this, at least to me, indicates that this idea that you know everyone's going to be leaving China overnight is uh, probably not, a, not very accurate. It's so interesting because I think some of those nuances get lost in the headlines. Yes. You know, uh, they just do. It can be true. I mean, I, I imagine there are two reasons that, that, that uh, uh, they might lead uh, U.S. companies somewhat less vocal than, uh, than, than we might uh, ex expect in this. Uh, uh, one is no U.S. CEO wants to show up in President's tweet. That's exactly. just not pleasant. I was just going to uh, say that. Say, yeah. uh, one. And two is, I think, uh, you know, if you are a company, operating in China or doing business in China, if you think there's some chance that uh, your government can help you to improve your bargaining position vis-a-vis -vis Chinese government, Chinese central local government, why not? You, you want the things to blow up a little bit right. until right. you right. Right. find things going the wrong uh, direction. Right. But for a while, I think many companies probably were holding out the hope that the president's more or less getting the right business strategy, mm -hmm. can improve up the negotiating strategy. Mm -hmm. and right now, there might be some Increasing reputation. I, I, I take, I'm take i taking uh, our, uh, meaning Columbia University's uh, executive ambitions to uh, China visiting the uh, uh, US Chamber of Commerce uh, uh, in various places, top visited the uh, US uh, companies uh, in uh, China. So now there's a bit of increasing recognition. Perhaps not all the president's strategy is productive from US companies. Mm -hmm. um, um, point of view. It's still there. You don't want to be too vocal with the business people you want to be. Behind the radar screen to try to get your view across right. without you know, having your either company's name or your own name showing up in the media. So, if you, what do you both think about whether the U.S. Um, the, the U.S.-China trade war is hitting the U.S. economy harder or the Chinese economy harder? Well, I think I mean I would argue based on the aggregate data, it's hitting the U.S. economy in large part. Remember what Trump said; he was very concerned about. A big trade deficit. Well, the trade deficit has gone up dramatically over the last year, not with China, but globally, because he put through a big tax increase, which will you know reduce savings, and if you have a big saving investment imbalance, you're going to have a bigger you're going to have a bigger trade imbalance. So that was number one. That was his number one claim. Everyone's treating us unfairly. We need to reduce the, the trade deficit. It hasn't happened. It's gotten bigger. Number two, he said we have to get more manufacturing jobs. Manufacturing jobs in the U.S. are shrinking. So on his two big goals, um, he's failed. And I don't see any, any likelihood that it's going to uh, change. Now look at it from China's point of view. I already indicated, for example, that China's still doing very well in terms of attracting foreign direct investment. They are also doing extremely well in terms of trade. China's share of global trade is going up this year, not down. Their sales to the U.S. are down significantly, but their sales to the rest of the world are up so much that their share of global trade uh, is increasing. Not dramatic, but uh, I don't think the slowdown in their economy, which always is attributed to the trade war, I don't think that's really very accurate because uh, uh, trade, trade has continued to be relatively strong Global trade is down about 3% in the first half. China's trade is basically flat so uh, on the export side. So China's share of global exports is going up. Because uh, China's uh, trade to GDP ratio is a lot higher than the U.S. So the U.S. about 20 something of China's, 30 something U.S. less than 20 percent China's, more than 30 percent. In principle, you know, a given drop in trade will damage China's economy more than, uh, more than uh, the U.S., certainly entrepreneurs in China are very concerned. But it's very heterogeneous. I uh, uh, once uh, asked a uh, Chinese exporting, uh, you know, export-oriented entrepreneur in Guangdong, what other things they worry about most these days? Mm -hmm. His answer surprised me initially. He said, I'm worried the trade war will end too soon. <laughs> <laughs> but turns out, his business was exporting stuff to Europe. The trade war, the U.S.-China trade frictions, actually, he, in this view, have kept the Chinese currency a bit weaker than otherwise the case. Hence, it's helpful to this business. Mm -hmm. right? if, if, if the trade war uh, end, Chinese currency might very, uh, might very, very well appreciate 
either on the strength of the fundamentals or by giving in to US demand to make Chinese currency more, more expensive. So I'm, this example says, in fact, it's, uh, it's very, uh, uh, very much dependent on what business you are in, you know, who's your primary, uh, primary uh, market. And of course, you know, uh, given the trade friction, national governments can also adopt policies to, to try to counter uh, counteract that, that Chinese government. You know, there's still many of the stuff they can, they can do to offset. It's not cost-free, but, but it does help to mitigate. Yeah, impact of uh, the trade war. Mm -hmm. So the Chinese economy is slowing down. Um, I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about why you see that happening. Nick, you said you think it's not a result of, of tariffs and the trade war. Um, people have been predicting that China's economic growth rate wasn't sustainable and that once the China, once China reached a certain level of development, um, I guess it was the Larry Summers thing, he, he, that was his quote, basically, right, saying that the, the um, economic growth engine is going to run out of steam, um, that growth would taper off, and that heavy interest rate <coughs> spending would no longer lead to such high returns. Um, economists have also talked about China possibly falling into the middle income trap. Uh, is that what's happening now, or is the economy slowing uh, as a result of other factors? What do you, what do you see happening? Well, I uh, I think there are two main reasons the economy is slowing down. One I've already mentioned, that is there's resource misallocation. More and more money and more and more credit is going to firms that have very low, state companies that on average have very low returns. But the second factor is the slowdown of the credit. Uh, credit is currently growing at a pace that's about a third less than it was a few years ago. So in other words, instead of growing at 15%, it's growing at roughly 10%. And uh, I think that was a very wise decision on the part of the Chinese. They have recognized that, uh, again, going back to what Sean Jin said about the global financial crisis, China had a huge stimulus which took the form of a big increase in credit, so the ratio of credit to GDP was, well, I don't want to say it was in the stratosphere, but it was getting up there. Mm -hmm. And uh, people in the financial sector were more and more worried about increasing financial risk and they got to the leadership. I think Xi Jinping has actually bought into this idea that they have to slow down the growth of credit. And they've actually had some success. In 2018, the ratio of credit to GDP did not go up for the first time in quite a few years. And I think this year maybe it's, it was like 260%. So at the end of 18, it was something like 258. So basically no change as opposed to the huge increase. So, uh, you know, many people have been saying, well, if growth slows down a little bit more, uh, you know, they'll have to go back to a very stimulative credit, credit policy. I don't think that's what's going to happen. You mentioned the, the recent speeches by Egon, the governor of the central bank, who's very, very firm on not wanting to go back to flooding the economy with credit in order to sustain growth. So I think it was a good uh, decision, basically. Um, and reduces financial risk, makes the growth more sustainable in the long run, but they're paying a price um, with slower credit growth. And there's an additional wrinkle to that, and that is that private firms have been particularly adversely affected because once private firms were losing access, as I showed you after 2012 or 13, to bank credit, they moved more and more to get credit from the so-called shadow banking system. And as part of this slowdown of credit growth, the, the authorities have recognized that shadow banking is less well regulated. Uh, some people call this non-bank financial institution lending, and, and it goes by different names. But the key point is that lending is less well regulated and presumably higher risk. So they're not just slowing down the growth of credit, they're changing the composition quite dramatically. It's credit growth from non-bank financial institutions is actually shrinking in absolute terms. In other words, it's not growing slower. It's shrinking in absolute terms, and that's had a very adverse effect on the, on the private sector. Mm -hmm. So and that, that shadow I, banking, explain a little bit about how that worked. I mean, basically, basically, <laughs> yeah. I mean, explain. Basically, it was <laughs> banks. Uh, you know, private the private sector couldn't get money, couldn't get loans. I mean, really, could have super oversimplified, but basically, couldn't get loans, and so new uh, channels, yeah. channels emerge where it, you know, ranging from Alibaba to every other company you can imagine, where they develop ways to let lend money to essentially to the private sector, right? But it's not you're saying it's, as you were saying, it's not regulated properly, and that led to so it kind of. 
it solved one of China's big, huge problems, right? And then, but now you know, it's worried about it. So, yeah. Either one. Either one. But the shadow banking, like you said, is you know, is essentially is uh, is, is, is uh, has served the purpose of channeling some of the funding to private sector uh, firms, both through some of balance sheet work of the banks as well as through activities outside banking system. Uh, in the last uh, year and a half, uh, Chinese regulators have uh, have. Uh, uh, so sort of cut off or uh, trying to greatly shrink okay. shrink this uh, shadow banking um, channel for the purpose of financial stability. So it has a good point, but has a very uh, un undesirable by consequence of, uh, of uh, making fund funding uh, less available to private sector uh, firms. So that's, uh, that's a problem. So they, do, they have not quite get the right balance uh, yet, but they need to work on uh, on the growth slowdown, I think it's important to distinguish two very different buckets really for the uh, growth slowdown. They, they call for very different policy uh, responses. Uh, I, I label the two buckets as transitory factors and structural or permanent factors. So, an example of a transitory factor that caused slowdown uh, is business cycle uh, uh, feature of other economies, for example, Europe. Uh, European Union uh, collectively is China's largest destination market in the last few years. Last decades, the uh, EU European market is not doing very well. We could say it could cause China's, uh, it was a negative factor for Chinese uh, growth. But this is like a uh, cycle feature by variation can change. And then once the US, uh, the EU recovers uh, stronger than what it's doing now, then it adds a lot of economic to Chinese uh, growth. That's an example of of a temporary factor, so temporary negative factor. The right policy uh, response is to have some stimulus program offset, uh, generate stronger domestic demand to offset weaken uh, export demand. Another uh, example of temporary uh, factor is U.S. U.S. initiative trade. Uh, you know, uh, to the extent the trade was not going to be a permanent feature of the global economy, you know, that's a temporary, a temporary thing that could call for some temporary policies to offset it. A third example of a uh, challenge of that we pause in the states by Chinese authority, and, and, and we can mention uh, a lot of them, and many contributed to resource misallocation. To the extent that kind of things can be reversed by better policies, it's not structural things, it's not, does not forecast the permanent decline in growth rates. These are temporary factors. But there's a separate bucket of factors that I, I, I call it uh, structural and more permanent. They are new as well. And I think two uh, in this bucket are especially uh, no, uh, worth uh, noting. One is demographics. Uh, uh, starting from 2000, uh, 2011, Chinese working age cohort, defined by uh, uh, the age cohort between 15 to, to uh, 59 or 65, depending on which uh, you, the one you want to use, has been growing at a negative rate. That is, year after year, you have fewer bodies That's the economist way of saying shrinking. Growing <laughs> 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 at a negative rate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just to make sense more scientific. But uh, just having fewer and fewer people working in the economy year after year, per se means, even if you hold per working person growth rate constant, GDP growth will come down, mathematically speaking. And that's part of what we see. And, 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 uh, and the shrinkage of working with each cohort is very, very dramatic. Uh, and as a side, you know, China has been uh, relaxing family planning policy, partly motivated by a desire to reverse that. Yeah. Right? So, so quite a few uh, relaxation measures have been taking place. Uh, the most recent one uh, um, took place at the end of 2015 to allow any couple to have uh, two, two children. Right? Mm -hmm. This policy, I want to note, in the next uh, decade and a half, will make growth rate worse, not bad. Mm. Why? Because the number of people who will enter, uh, enter labor force will, be, will not be changed by this relaxation family policy for a decade and a half. 20, 20 no years, one yeah. knows how to produce an 18 year old by the way. This relaxation family policy for a while will only make dependence ratio worse. Eventually, we'll make things better off. Right? So that's one. So that, but nonetheless, uh, demographics are very important structural factors. Hard to, if you can do something, I can talk about that, but, but, but not uh, something that can be helped by monetary policy. Uh, uh, 
lose my paper, he will not help. The other structural factor is just a natural thing we see country after country, you know, both logic and, uh, and, and, and country experience tell, tells us as the country's labor cost uh, rises, the, you, you can no longer compete with other countries based on cheaper labor. You have to rely on productivity growth, you have to rely on innovation. Growth based on productivity increase uh, and or innovation is intrinsically harder. That's why we do growth miracle only happens outside high income countries. High income countries are growth frontier. Their source of growth is innovation, productivity growth. It's intrinsically harder. So for US in the last 200 years, the edge growth rate is somewhere between 2 to 3 percent. That's pretty good growth if you are at frontier. China is not at frontier, but relative to all parts, it's getting closer to frontier. Therefore, it has to, in relative sense, rely more on innovation-based growth, and that's just harder. Mm -hmm. And I give you that, that's another structural reason for the growth to slow down. Let's perceive that peace to slow down is not a cause for panic. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sign of maturity, right? And the right response to that is, is, is not more money supply, uh, more fiscal stimulus, <coughs> but working on ways to improve innovation, improve productivity, reduce uh, you know, resource, uh, some resource allocation there uh, is uh, as well. So I'm going to ask one more question, but in the meantime I want, before I open it up to the floor, so in the meantime I want you all to be thinking about your questions that you want to ask um, in, you know, before we end our program. So um, talk a little bit about innovation. I mean, I guess, I guess we still want, there's lots of um, talk that, you know, keep, the pendulum keeps spin, swinging back and forth, right? At first it's kind of, China can't possibly innovate because of their state mandated system, et cetera, and that's not possible. And then there's, oh my God, innovative and crazy, they're, you know, way ahead of the United States in terms of technological innovation, et cetera. Is the truth somewhere in between? And do you think China will be able to innovate enough so that they can get through this um, economic transition that they need to go through? Anybody? Yeah. Uh, well, so first, I mean, so first of all, you know, there's a, uh, so it's easy to find, hold it, hold you can, yeah, you can go. Google and easy to find jokes about Chinese inability to uh, innovate. So one of my friends uh, told me, uh, you know, this is uh, Chinese entrepreneurs. In, in, in this country, R&D stands for replication and duplication. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, you know, jokes about copyright violation, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, low quality copy and so on and so forth. At the same time, you know, they, they, you can also get other people who tell you the rate of uh, patent, uh, you know, application and patent receipts in China has been so fast. Maybe people, some people uh, have started quoting a number that claims that nowadays, uh, in any given uh, year, there are more patents issued to Chinese firm than to US firm, the, the former leader in global uh, patent uh, receipts. Now, of course, as a researcher, I, I, I always skeptical about anything that uh, you know, uh, officially declared in any country, especially uh, especially uh, China. So, so you know, you look at data, indeed you can find uh, the Chinese patent, patent granted to Chinese firm been going very, very fast, and faster than other uh, countries. Mm -hmm. but, you know, but what about uh, quality of those patents? Right? So is this uh, patent really as good as patent uh, uh, elsewhere? Uh -huh. Well, one way to get a handle on this, you know, get a sense about the growth of uh, Chinese innovation is measured by patent. Not all innovation can be measured by patent, but patent has to be something that's relatively viable. One way to get handled on quality adjusted growth is to look at US patents granted to Chinese firm compared to US patents granted to other firms from other countries, because you know, uh, those uh, international firms that have interest in the US market tends to also apply for patent in the US. If you look at that, it turns out the growth rate, so if you look at the US pattern for to firms from those countries, because Chinese uh, firms' share of US pattern still is behind the US. US, US still is the leader in terms of US pattern for to, to, to firms. The Chinese uh, uh, firms' share is rising very, very fast, faster than what you would expect it based on the country's uh, income, uh, uh, income level. So that uh, gave me uh, so therefore, I can prove from, uh, from that data that uh, the innovation is real and rate of innovation is real. And if you think about it, it's perhaps not surprising that 10 or 20 years ago, when Chinese labor cost was so low, innovation was a nice thing, but not a necessary thing. 
So therefore, you know, we see a lot of copying and super not enough effort in putting a uh, uh, installation. Sorry, I missed that. Could you say it? I'm happy to say one more thing. Today, you know, for, for firms and many sets, it's increasingly become a necessity. <laughs> Saying that because innovation has become a necessity for increasing the number of firms and increasing the number of sectors, that's why we see there's a, 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 a reinforced effort to do uh, innovation. Mm -hmm. Now, innovation is not all good and, uh, in good and, and wonderful. In terms of uh, you know the public support for innovation, today most innovation, as measured by PET, comes from in China has come from private sector firms. But the public support for innovation overwhelmingly favors stable firms, which is a sign of dedication. In other words, if the innovation support system can be reformed to truly observe competitive neutrality, the rate of innovation will grow even faster. That's my, my, my conclusion. Well, this is a complicated subject, but I would just offer one observation. One, one standard metric for looking at innovation is something economists call total factor productivity. How, how much a kind of bundle of inputs contribute to output? If it's growing, that's factor, total factor productivity. And China actually had very high total factor productivity growth uh, from the early 80s all the way up until the global financial crisis. And it explained a very large share of China's expansion. People that do the disaggregation, I'm, I'm not in this business, but I read a lot of these studies. People that do this disaggregation actually point out that the raw growth of the labor force only accounted for 10% of China's growth between 78 and roughly 2010. A lot of the improvement came from, uh, a lot of the growth came from innovation, improvements in productivity, increases in the quality of labor, not just the quantity. Since, uh, you know, over the last 10 years, productivity growth has declined. Well, there are several estimates out there, but they're all way below the long-term trend. And I think, I can't prove it, but I, can't, I have to suspect that it's related to what John Jin has said, and that is, as you re-emphasize the state sector, give them more resources, they're not uh, most of the innovation, I think, was coming out of the private sector, and the private sector is being squeezed now, and productivity growth is slowing down. So I think these are, to some extent, I don't know, but to some extent, two sides of the same coin. If you want to have innovation, you have to give a greater role for entrepreneurs, you have to have you know, competitive neutrality, which means everybody has the same access to credit based on the, 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 the credit worthiness. Uh, you don't have nationalization of private companies. Uh, you don't force private entrepreneurs to set up party committees to have, you know, kind of interfere in the way they run their business, which has been happening in China. So uh, I think China is inherently a high productivity, high innovation place, but you've got to get the incentives right, as Shanjit said. And the private sector has been really unhappy for quite a number of years now, right? I mean, they, they have been struggling and, and dealing with uh, more interference and um, inability to get loans and all these kinds of things. Yeah, and, I, and I think nationalization of private firms has, it, uh, has certainly been um, a drag on the incentive for private companies to invest and to innovate and the lack of credit, increased interference of the party. Um, I think all of these things add up to an environment that has not been as conducive to innovation as let's say the first 30 or 35 years of reform starting in the late 70s. So there, there are some uh, changes in the you know, more recent uh, uh, year and month. You know, I mentioned about uh, uh, massive uh, tax cuts, which uh, uh, you know, entrepreneurs, private entrepreneurs told me we were very meaningful to them. And the extent of tax cuts uh, seems to be larger than they had expected. Uh, that's one. And the other is uh, the Prime Minister has been chanting about uh, uh, reducing, uh, you know, essentially deregulating on firm registration. So China has uh, the explosion deregulating de um, firm registration. So okay. before, uh, you know, to be formally registered, you have to have uh, what's called registered capital, which is not a, a, a barrier to entry for uh -huh. many private, private sector firms. And then that, that uh, requirement has been uh, 
uh, removed, so you sort of see the exposure of this uh, flow. And then technology helps, right? So with all that government intervention, so, so, so you have to have uh, Tencent and others. Not only, obviously, those uh, firms itself are doing fantastic well in terms of their revenue growth and profit growth, but they cannot be a catalyst for other private sector uh, firms. I uh, take the example of uh, uh, small entrepreneurs on, uh, on uh, Alibaba. Right? So before e-commerce, farmers are the farmers. If you want to sell something, you have to sell through intermediaries. Intermediaries charge a very high fee, and your products cannot really reach a uh, very far from where, where you live and work. Today, if you are tea growers in, uh, in Fujian or suitcase makers in Sanxi, you can sell anywhere in the country, sometimes globally, through e-commerce. And uh, a very interesting uh, number on the uh, e-commerce number is, you know, we know offline, uh, for un offline entrepreneurs, men dominates entrepreneurs. Good or bad reason, separate question, men dominates. You look at online entrepreneurs, there are as many women entrepreneurs as, uh, as men entrepreneurs. So, so, so it's not the, yeah. the purpose of the IMAP, but right. it happened to uh, generate the result that it shows that it, 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 you know, there's more uh, gender equity uh, in terms of entrepreneurship and online, online business. Another thing that the both uh, you know, Alibaba tech and other uh, big tech companies do is to now provide lending. So, so uh, um, uh, they mentioned about the difficult financing that we face by. by, by uh, <coughs> well, today, uh, you know, and financial, the, the, the part of the Ali uh, group specializing in financial things, is China's largest uh, credit card, uh, credit card uh, issuer and largest. Uh, micro and, and, and uh, uh, you know, uh, lending to, to firms. Virtually all of their uh, borrowers, uh, you know, loan recipients, are private sector uh, firms. The firms really take off. On. So, 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 so fintech, big tech, in fact, also helps to to uh, supplement the, uh, the the national financial system in a way that's very good for for private sector growth. Mm -hmm. Let's open it up to questions from the floor. I see you were very enthusiastic, so um, can you introduce yourself and then ask your question? Okay, I'm making a microphone? Yeah. Okay. My name is Dwayne Rice, and I'm a member of the uh, China Institute. And um, regarding what's next for the uh, Chinese economy, can you comment, uh, Dr. or Professor Wei, on the role of the um, Belt and Road Initiative and the Maritime Silk Road in Africa? in China's future economic and geopolitical strategy, and two, regarding this the current uh, dispute, trade dispute or trade war, whichever you want to call it, between China and the United States, how much of it do you feel is economic, and how much, or actually trade related, and how much is geopolitical in that there is a fear of what's called defensive realism, a fear that China or East Asia may overtake the West. How much, I mean, can you comment on these? Such a great, great question. I'm going to let you get away with it, but for everybody else, can you limit it to one question? Those are really good questions, so go, go ahead. Uh, first, I'm Dalton and Will, for the two persons in the room who, who may not be familiar with the Dalton. Right, thank you. This, yeah. this is the uh, you know, Chinese government mm -hmm. initiated uh, program uh, following uh, President Xi's two speeches. Mm -hmm. Emphasizing there are two, essentially two uh, key components. One is about uh, greater physical connectivity, uh, you know, among countries in East Asia, uh, Central Asia, South, South and Southeast Asia, and, and, and Europe. Now, some people expand the notion to include Africa, uh, even uh, in Latin America. Um, and the second component is about the greater uh, uh, policy dialogue and coordination. I think that's sort of, this is the official notion of. Uh, World Bank uh, World Initiative. Uh, uh, there are, uh, you know, uh, a lot of uh, pushbacks uh, we, we hear in the media and uh, elsewhere. This, the first concern include potential excessive debt that uh, you know, the Belt and Road Project receiving countries might incur. Concern about uh, the implementation of those uh, uh, projects. Uh, they will not have the same kind of a governance standard. You know, uh, corruption and so on, environmental standard and, and so on. So this, these are the, these are the, uh, certainly a, a concern that there's also concern about erosion of the U.S. Uh, hegemony in global systems. Never express that it's always a erosion of global governance uh, standard. It really means erosion of the U.S. Uh, hegemony in this uh, in this uh, case. I think there are um, uh, 
uh, these are not intractable problems. The, the expression of concern is right and, and useful. At the same time, I think there are uh, uh, you know, uh, potential ways to, to, to that we can work with to make to make sure that the Belt and Road Project benefits uh, those uh, countries uh, as well as China with minimal negative uh, side. For example, on the debt sustainability, most uh, almost all these Belt and Road countries are members of MEF. MEF is, is in the business of helping member countries to figure out this sustainability. No Belt and Road country yes, is for, yes, to work on how much additional debt you can take. Are there other ways to finance your projects so that you will not have uh, getting to a, a, a debt uh, crisis? No country, uh, we should note, uh, is forced uh, to take on those projects because it has also the country that doesn't have the ability to force the country to take on projects they don't, they don't, they don't want. But that's a sort of simplistic way. I mean, you know, they're not forced, of course, but if they... The country has to invite us. Yeah. For example, as an example, but if you're country, as an example of a country that say no, India. India is the one country that pushed back. Yeah. India probably needs a lot of infrastructure projects, <coughs> but India worries about non-economic objectives. Right? They want to they do not want to reduce influence that they in South Asia and uh, elsewhere. India does not want to sign up. Yes, exactly. Yeah. If you don't want to sign up, sure. I don't think China has a way to force them sure. to sign up. But, uh, yes. uh, so, so those countries that have those projects uh, are those that in their own judgment they think it's beneficial uh, uh, to them. Mm -hmm. Now, they, are the judgment uh, of sound quality? We do not know, but, you know, but I'm just saying mm -hmm. there are international organizations uh, of which these countries are members uh, can, can help with this. On governance, uh, and, uh, standard uh, and environmental <coughs> safeguards, and so on. You know, ADB, World Bank kind of business. Uh, every project, I spent some years at the ADB. Every project these banks do apply very high uh, safe, safeguards to, to the produce. And, and then there's sort of expertise you can, you, you, you can transfer and, and, and countries can learn. Uh, you know, part of the Belt and Road Initiative uh, done through AIB and so on, I think AIB declares that they want to adopt not just best international practices, uh, sometimes they want to have practices better than existing best international practices. So they, are, they include the environmental safeguards uh, guards and economic uh, safeguards and so on. So, so, so in other words, the problems that, and the risk pointed out are real and worth pointing out, but these are not uh, intractable problems. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, another question. Yep, go ahead, please. Hi, Dr. Charlie Ryan, financial analyst. So we've heard that over the last few years, uh, various government officials and also just people um, in the higher up uh, praise the private sector. Right? It's responsible for growth, employment, innovation, sounds like all the things that China needs. But then just based on what we see here today and also all the data that's been published, the state sector is rising, getting a stronger. So is, is there some kind of a contradiction here? Like, how do we understand what they're saying and also what the data is saying? Or is, is, there, is there no contradiction at all? Well, you're, you're very correct to point out that there has been a lot of verbal support for the private sector. Xi Jinping had this highly well-reported meeting with private entrepreneurs in which he was singing their praises and talking about how important the private sector was for China's economic growth and made some noises about how credit conditions and other circumstances that the private sector faced would be improved. Uh, now, you, you, you might think, well, in an authoritarian system, if the top guy says you know, something has to change, it will change, particularly when it's eating paper. But I, I don't think much has really changed. And I think one of the underlying problems is the banks are much less interested in lending to private companies because if you lend to a state company, there's an implicit guarantee. If they want to get uh, you know, competitive neutrality, uh, a level playing field in terms of who gets access to credit based on their credit worthiness, then you have to have a system where the chance of, you know, if a, if a company does not do well and can't repay its loans and so forth, it will either go bankrupt or it will be taken over by another company. And as I mentioned earlier, that's not what is happening in China. 40% of state companies lose money, very few of them uh, exit. So if you're a banker, it, it makes much more sense to lend to the state company, even if you think their returns are very low, 
uh, than to take a chance on a private company, even though on average private companies have higher returns. So I think if they really want to change things, they have to introduce the kind of changes that would really result in competitive neutrality in the financial sector. Um, so so you mean allowing more bankruptcies, for example? Yes, allowing more bankruptcies and, and having and having the creditors bear the, the consequences. So if you're a bank today, you know, you, you, your state borrowers are not going to go bankrupt. Uh, they're going to get subsidies, and uh, you're better off than the state companies. And if you talk to bankers, that, that's what they'll tell you. So I, I talked to the banker. Uh, I recently asked a senior executive of uh, uh, one of the largest bank uh, in China. Why don't you make more loans to private sector firms? So uh, she said, "We well, you know, you know, uh, you know, in her uh, uh, bank, uh, something like eighty percent of loans goes to state loans, the entire national uh, uh, division, wow. twenty goes to private sector." Wow. But, but but she said, "You know what? Uh, we, when you look at our bank loans, eighty percent of our bank loans come from this twenty percent." Uh, private sector firms. So, so wow. me as a bank, if our, our government, she said, including central bank, uh, central bank, uh, prime minister, asks us to make more loans to private sector firms. But I want to be a responsible banker. I don't know how to do it in a way, uh, you know, without without making my uh, uh, you know a bad uh, uh, ratio to go up. So what what lies behind this, I think, is you know uh, in the, 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 the resource allocation pattern that they point out. It's not so much about Banks always ask themselves every morning, can I make more loans for stay on firms? Not so much of this. Right. But there's something else going on there, including perhaps an uh, asymmetric uh, uh, implicit uh, uh, guarantee and, and other stuff. And this also going to be hard. Right now, China's in the Chinese economy is in phase of business cycles. There are many sectors in which private sector firms are acting are in uh, relative economic difficulties. That makes from, from the lenders' point of view, it's, it's, you know, it's hard to, to augment their loans to. To, uh, to the private sector. The, the, uh, the chairman of the Ch uh, China's uh, uh, Banking and, and, and uh, Insurance Regulator uh, Commission, uh, when, when he was taking over the job, uh, even said that he wanted to mandate each state owned bank to have a minimal amount of uh, loans to private sector firms. Uh, firms. Bank Banker tell me this is unworkable. They will make our banks to the to, to bank. So, so, so this, but this example shows two things. Banks think they have sound business reasons right, not to expand right. loans to private sector. And yet, government is trying to use non market way to raise funding. <laughs> <laughs> That's totally fascinating. Okay. okay. I, think that that one yeah. comment. I think what that points out is that banks have not really developed any real skills at credit analysis. Mm -hmm. If the average returns of private companies are three times those of state companies, but somehow all the bad loans are being generated by private companies. I think the banks are doing something wrong. Uh, well, I would qualify this a little bit. Part of the, <laughs> you know, real bankers, part of the reason for why some borrowers have higher return is that affects risk. You know, to first order approximation, risk and return, expected returns are go hand in hand. Right? So bankers will tell you, you don't want to just make, just because someone is willing to pay high interest interest you want your big loans uh, uh, to them. So that's a piece of the yeah. piece of this. But uh, 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 so so that so we need to clearly the country according to the country. So they're good at risk analysis, they're just not good at credit so, analysis. So so in this context I want to I want to go back to the point about uh, fintechs. The, the fintechs is a very interesting player in this uh, regard. They simultaneously figure out so, so typical private sector uh, firm that couldn't um, uh, get bank loans face the following set of problems. Number one, they may not have collateral. Number two, it's very costly to figure out what their true credit worth is. Number three, they are genuinely uh, borrowers who borrow and find a way not to pay back, even if they can pay back, mm -hmm. uh, what the economists call strategic uh, default or moral, moral hazard. FinTech, interestingly, figure out a way to solve all three problems for a subset of entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. Number one, you know, uh, if, if you are a firm that's active, so let's take, take uh, bank financial as an example. For an entrepreneur that's active on, uh, on the Alibaba platform, I know the business, but I mean, I mean the uh, uh, financial uh, you know, uh, right. can see how well the firm is growing. I can also read customer 
uh, customer reviews, I know how, how good the, the, the product uh, is. I have a pretty good way to guess how well the business will, will, will grow such so one advantage. Second, second advantage, in terms of process loans, typically when a small entrepreneur come, uh, come to a bank, so the bank will tell me, someone come here to ask for a $10 million loan, versus someone who come here to ask for a $1,000 loan, it costs almost the same for me to process it. I don't want to do business with anyone who asks for small loans. FinTech does not have that problem, because the cost of processing is so low, they say, yeah, we can deal with that. So that's the second one. But the third uh, 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 challenge that FinTech has successfully addressed is this deterring more of that, not being that when you, when you can. Because if you, are, if you are an online business, it's actually, you, you might think if you do not pay back, and financial through its uh, cousin, uh, Alibaba, uh, or tmod.com can shut you down. And that's very expensive for you. So just moving somewhere else is not a really viable uh, option. All, all three things make it uh, possible for FinTech to extend uncollateralized loans to private sector firms that previously couldn't get a bank loan. So, so I think this actually offers you know, one of the, uh, one of the, sort of the uh, uh, potential areas where we can see, uh, we can see more uh, I think we have time for two more questions. So I pointed to this gentleman here. And then here. Thank you. Uh, my name is Tian Fu Ma. Uh, I'm an assistant professor of marketing at Montclair State University across the Helena River. So uh, certainly, it's no doubt that the uh, private sector in China has a higher efficiency in innovation and productivity. What I wonder if it is a level playing field for the uh, state-run companies. For example, the state-run company, they have to comply with a higher environmental protection standard. For example, they cannot ask their employees to work on this infamous 996 schedule, which means start from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m working whole day for six days a week, right? So if we uh, 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 enforce the same labor condition, environmental condition, for the private sector, can private sector still have the same level of uh, innovation and efficiency? So I mean, uh, if we equalize the condition, are we overestimating the efficiency of the private sector? I think that's, that's the question. I think it's a very good question. I don't have an answer, um, uh, but re remember there are lots and lots of private firms in sectors where environmental restrictions are not, you know, they're not generating uh, pollution or discharges of, uh, you know, byproducts that are hazardous to the environment. Um, so I think the environmental issue applies in part of the economy, but I'm not sure how big it is. Now the hours and the other conditions of employment uh, is a more interesting question. I don't know the extent to which China, you know, China does have some labor laws and maybe they're not enforced um, very uh, evenly and so that could be a factor. So, so, so let me add, let me add something on, on that. I, the reason why I ask this question is just that... Very, just very quickly. Yeah, recently, you know, Jack Ma had this comment that it's, it's a fortunate for us to work 996. Yeah. And, uh, and, there, and it caused a lot of turmoil uh, in, yeah, in the in a PR crisis for, for Alibaba. And therefore, it will be interesting for, because the private sector has a lot of leeway in terms of even getting, asking their employees to work, to work a lot of hours. Uh -huh. I actually know plenty of people working in state-owned firms uh -huh. working very long hours and weekends, uh -huh. including financial situation executive. Yeah. Now it's in the last, I think, uh, 2015. Uh, a Chinese financial institution executive also face a very face a, uh, a salary cap, so they are being underpaid and continue to work very long hours. I look at you know, and certain assistant professors in state <laughs> universities in China work on weekends and evenings. I know that because I talked to some of my co-authors. They say work. I know that they work. So much for the Communist Party taking care of its workers. <laughs> I think that the main difference is not so much between um, uh, you know, across firm of different ownership, but, but, but to, between large firms and small firms. I think large private sector firms also observe uh, you know, face uh, a stronger uh, imp implementation uh, of environment and any other kind of uh, standards. And small firms will, will, will try to uh, bypass uh, those uh, things uh, like the counterparts in 
other uh, country partly because enforcement costs are very high. If you, have, if you have government enforcer, you have to be selective. Mm -hmm. yeah, and you, you will aim at uh, large, uh, large players uh, first. Question from a banker. <laughs> Um, I'm Winnie Pan. Yes, I'm a private banker with uh, HSBC. Um, so I actually uh, grew up in China and spent my adult years in the United States. So I just came uh, back, back to China for three weeks and met so many people. And I have two observations. One, you're right, the state is striking back and then they're taking over the companies, right? So my concern about that is the government companies historically Everyone's like, it's a dark world fan, right? So it's like, my life is going to last forever because, you know, when people get in, 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 in the company, get in, in, in efficiency, right? So that concerns me. I'd like to know what do you think the cycle of the state owned companies will last? Secondly, my um, observation is everyone gets a big pension plan that worries me in China. Do you have any comments on that? I mean, basically, all these retired people who did not pay, like we pay social security mm -hmm. since we have you know, the first job, but in China they did not. All of a sudden, everyone's getting equivalent to what they had in salary and rising. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering how this uh, government is going to pay for mm -hmm. massive pension plan. Well, I'll say, I'll say something on the pension side. You're absolutely correct. China has overpromised on pensions, and uh, if you look at what's happened over the last 10 or 15 years, it's, it's a pay-as-you-go system but they have built up no reserves. And the payout now is actually less than the incoming. And the pension system requires a direct subsidy from the fiscal system, from the Ministry of Finance. So, and it's only going to get worse, uh, as Zhang Jin has already alluded to, with the aging, uh, aging of the population. A number of suggestions have been made, but the most important <coughs> way of alleviating this problem in the long run, in the short run, would be to raise the retirement age. You know, they set these retirement ages back in the early 50s when nobody was living to the retirement age. And so women are retiring at 55, men at 60. Many people retire before the official age. And uh, if they would raise the retirement age, as the U.S. has done and some other countries have done, uh, this would alleviate the part of the problem in the short run. And the Ministry of whatever, I can't remember, they've changed their name several times, the Ministry of Human Resources and Labor or something like that. The minister announced two years ago that they had a plan for raising the retirement age. I don't think it's happened. Mm -hmm. I think it's just like any other country. You talk about raising the retirement age and people get very unhappy. <laughs> Especially those that are near... <laughs> I'm so glad you said that Nick, because I just have to share that you know practically every time I go to China I'm in the back of a cab chit-chatting with the taxi driver and the taxi driver inevitably will turn around to me and say Ni hai no <laughs> <laughs> which I you haven't retired yet and, uh, so yeah it's, it makes me feel better to know that uh, you know it is, they do retire very young in China. <laughs> <laughs> they have a even lower retirement age for, for women. Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. yes. <laughs> the pension has uh, two components. There is a pay as you go component. There's also a fully funded for saving uh, component. It's the first component that potentially could uh, uh, face uh, fiscal uh, crisis. <laughs> the other one is the postponing retirement age and so on. There are other stuff the government uh, can do. For example, uh, by, by design, uh, all the state-owned firms listed on the stock exchange are supposed to transfer their shares or uh, fraction their shares to the to the pension uh, funds. You started from the very beginning when uh, when when, when the, 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 the time uh, the social security system was uh, was uh, set up. The transfer is incomplete uh, right now. The the, the security firm uh, security uh, fund has a claim on uh, essentially ten. I think it's ten percent of the listed companies. Uh, Shares is the shares uh, growing value that uh, security funds uh, fiscal situation can improve. Plus, there's also in this you know, the, 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 the residual uh, gap uh, can be uh, can be uh, by, the, by, by, by the tax uh, essentially national finance uh, transfer. So, China ironically, by the way, the, the low interest uh, environment helps a little bit uh, in a way. So, in the US, so, so 10 15 years ago. In this country, we talk about the imminent pension crisis. We are no longer talking about 
that uh, at the moment, partly because we have had a decade of very low interest rate, temporarily suppressed the bond uh, a, a, a little bit. And I think this could come back. Uh, so, so, so China is not imminent crisis yet, and they still have some uh, leeway to work on it. That's something that we want to look into. So I'm going to ask one last question and take it a few minutes over the end. But um, I guess a kind of politically incorrect question, which is going back again to the financial crisis 2008, where you know Wang Qishan says the teacher is no longer looking so great. Um, and you know what my question, I guess, is: Is there a chance that maybe they there is another way? That maybe maybe they're they have found a third way or whatever where you know um, the state sector combined with the private sector is a way that works for China. I mean, is there a chance that, uh, I, you know, there are times when I sort of feel like, who are we to tell them what they should be doing with their economy? But I want to hear you both respond as economists to that, to that um, question. I think, um, uh, you know, I think the Chinese are looking around. What's happening in Europe? They, they've just adapted a whole system where the competitive rules are going to be suspended and the subsidy rules are going to be suspended for high priority projects that are going to be pushed on a, across European yeah. basis. So yeah. it, has, it sounds very much like the Made in China 2025. Mm -hmm. Big mm -hmm. pools of state money are going to be put into quantum computing, artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. bat the one that's already started is batteries. Uh, China, uh, Europe didn't have a big battery, uh, you know, for the wave of electric vehicles, which is supposedly uh, almost upon us. They were going to have real batteries coming from China or the U.S. And now they have a great big consortium of uh, companies, mostly with the government money, uh, building huge battery factories. So, and they're going to do this in other areas. So, I think if the Chinese look around. They'll say, "Hey, um, other countries, other countries are doing this. Why can't we?" And coming from you, that's totally fascinating because I think of you as someone who's you know always saying it's the markets, it's the markets and, and the private sector that's driving growth, etc. Well, you can still you have see some, a place you can still have some market discipline even when these things that have some government funding. So some uh, elements about how the economy works do work uh, the same way uh, across the, uh, across the world. It includes security of property rights, important for investment growth. It includes incentives important to mess up incentive to mess up uh, growth. So right. These are universally yeah. Yeah. true. China has not found a way to get around uh, that. Mm -hmm. Much of the reform the last 40 decades is to make on those dimensions better and better. Populars become progressively more secure. Uh, incentives are more and more, uh, more, more, and more uh, aligned with increasing uh, number of uh, areas. So China is not even in the But there are other things, you know, different countries face different constraints. But so even though you can have the same kind of general principle, they may express themselves in very different ways. Cultural matters, uh, you know, uh, constraint matters, precondition matters, and, and compared to advantage uh, 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 matters. So, 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 so therefore, there's no necessary reason that ultimately, if China uh, has a, a successful formula, it will look exactly like what we see right. in the US. Across the world, we see across the uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, broadly market-based economy with different emphasis. Germany certainly does not think their model is the same as the US. I mean, they emphasize stuff that we don't have uh, here and vice versa. They all broadly high income countries. So, so, uh, you know, the, 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 so, so a bit of variety is useful. In fact, more and more organizations recognize this with a, with a set of common principles that you want to emphasize. But since different, different countries are in different stages of development, might be different phases of business cycles, have different history, different, different, different backgrounds. There will be some variety. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. so, but all politicians want to emphasize their country's own. If China says that China is not the only one that says this, every, country, every politician, say, every country will say, my country is unique. Okay? Also, uniquely, lucky or uniquely, they said that. Right? So, so that uh, is not uh, exception. Right, well, I want to thank you both for walking.